When you know what healthy looks like, it helps you know how to stay healthy or to get healthy. Uh, around a year ago, one of our members, Jim Good, you may know Jim because he's often serving in the tech booth in the back, uh, he was riding his bike with his grandchildren and he was just exhausted. And he was having trouble keeping up, or at least he wasn't, you know, uh, feeling as good as he used to. And so uh, that, that wasn't the first time he'd felt that way. And so he started thinking, like, I think there's something wrong. And it was more than just, you know, how do I say this? You know, all of us are not getting any younger. Right? It was more than that, he just, something wasn't right. right. And so he went to the doctor, and when he went to the doctor, the doctor said, all right, we'll do a stress test and see how you do. Well, a couple of tests later, it turns out that uh, one of Jim's arteries was 100% blocked. And he needed a stint put in immediately. We got the stint put in uh, pretty, pretty shortly after that. And uh, on the day of the procedure, we got a little text saying that the surgery went well, but I wanted to call from the next day to see how he was doing. And so there I am in my office, waiting in my office for the call. There's Jaden in his office right across the way, waiting for an update from Jim. And who walks through the door? But Jim Good, the day after his procedure. And Jim says to us, guys, I felt so good. Now that blockage is open, I didn't realize how much I was getting worn out. And I feel like I could finally breathe and I have more energy now. And I just had to ride my bike over here and come see you guys. The point of the story is, not that Jim's crazy and awesome and amazing, but uh, also that because he knew what healthy looked like and felt like for him, he knew when something was off that was invisible to the eye that no one else could see because he knew what healthy was. And so he didn't just attribute it to something. He got it checked out, and it's a good thing that he did because it could have turned out much differently if he had not discovered a 100% blockage uh, sooner. So or as soon as he did. And I bring that up because it's true not only of our physical health, but of our spiritual health as well. When we know what healthy looks like, it helps us maintain our spiritual health. It helps us, you know, fix our spiritual health if it's not going well. Or encourages us to continue our pathway of growth if we find ourselves in a healthy spot. Because sometimes we find ourselves wondering, like, man, I, I was growing and I was developing, and now I just kind of plateaued and I'm not sure what's going on with me. Or, or sometimes we look around and we hear someone else's testimony and we say, well, why is, yeah, I, I hear how God is working in their lives and I just, man, over time I feel like I've gotten disconnected. Or, or maybe it's simply that, hey, it's going well. I need that encouragement to continue to grow and develop in my faith. We're going to talk about all those things today because that is, we're going to be able to understand what a healthy person in Christ looks like as we open up in the book of Colossians today. Uh, we're going to start this really when we're getting started properly in our series. We kind of introduced the book last week, but this week we're really getting into the meat of it uh, in Colossians chapter 1. And what we're going to do is look at what does it look like for us to be healthy, uh, two, what does it look like for, for us to grow in a healthy way, and then finally how we actually do that as the church here at Pine Grove, Okay. All right, uh, Colossians chapter 1, you could turn there, because we are starting right at the beginning, verse 1. Colossians chapter 1. Paul starts out the letter to this church at a place called Colossae, like he does most of the letters at the time. You start with the person who's sending the letter first, and then the, that who it's being addressed to. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers at the church, in the church at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God, our Father. And yes, it is just an opening line. It's a way to start the letter, but don't let it go past too, too far. Throughout the rest of the book, he is going to pray for their peace and, 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 and pray for the, that they would understand God's grace and grow in it. And so these aren't throwaway lines. This is what he wants them to understand as he writes them this letter. And so he starts out with this prayer for them. He says, we thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which was come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God 
in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. All right, let's start from the, the, the backward, the, the end of that, and, and, then, and then go back through. Because who is Epaphras? What does he have to do with any of this? Well, let's give you a little background about this letter that Paul is writing to the Colossians. Uh, Paul has actually never met the Colossians. Uh, Paul, I, I don't know if he's ever been to Colossae or not, but at this point, he didn't know the church there. Uh, he knew the church there because it was planted by someone else, uh, Epaphras, uh, who he mentions here uh, in this letter. Uh, Paul had a very specific church planting uh, strategy when it came to him spreading the gospel, as it says here, and increasing and, and going out through all the land. And you could bring up a map. Uh, Colossae was kind of on the edge in the inland part, uh, but he spent a lot of time in the city of Eph Ephesus. Because Ephesus was a major port city, it was a major trade city. And so he spent most of his time on those major cities so that there were churches that would develop there, that people would be discipled, that they'd be trained, and then they would be sent out to the rest of the region since so many people were coming and going and to and from these major port cities, places like Ephesus. Colossae is about 100 uh, miles uh, inland from Ephesus, but it's on a major trade road. So it shouldn't surprise us that it went from Ephesus, this place where Paul hoped to spread the gospel for the region, and has made its way inland since it's a trade road between Ephesus and the Euphrates uh, River, I believe. Paul here is writing this letter while he's in prison, we find out in chapter 2 at the end of chapter 1. He's in prison, and scholars debate where he is in prison. Uh, he might be in prison in Rome. He's definitely in prison there because of his work of the gospel. He's in prison in Caesarea. Uh, he certainly was in prison there, or he was imprisoned in Ephesus. While there's no uh, definite, it doesn't say here which one he's imprisoned in, I tend to think he was imprisoned at Ephesus in the time. Because not only has Epaphras visited him and told him about the church at Colossae and how they are growing, but Onesimus, who we'll read about later in a book, also visited him. Now look at that map. Rome is pretty far away. Uh, I don't care how much you want to see Paul. That's a, that's a pretty long journey. And so I think likely this is one of his imprisonments when he was in Ephesus. Um, although, you know, again, the letter doesn't say exactly. We just know he's in prison and he's writing to these people because he wants to encourage him. And it's interesting how the letter starts. Because unlike many of the other letters to the churches, uh, he's really thankful for the things that are going on here at Colossae. That's not always the case. Sometimes he's writing through these letters to the churches because they've got a big problem. I think of the poor Corinthians and their struggles trying to figure out how to do this whole Christian thing. They're having a hard time. But here at Colossae, he really starts in a letter and throughout the rest of it is saying, hey, you guys are in pretty good shape. Wow, look at what the Lord has done among you. I want to encourage you so you stay on the right path. So nothing makes you turn from the right or to the left, that you stay on this path of following Christ. And he commends them and, and is thankful to God for three attributes that this church is demonstrating. Essential attributes. And if we look at these attributes and what he's thankful for at the church of Colossae, where things are going decently, you know, they're not perfect, but that, you know, no one is, but things are going decently, then perhaps we too might learn the characteristics that we as followers of Jesus Christ should take on as well. So that brings us to our th first point, that there are three characteristics that this church is demonstrating that Paul calls out both in this chapter, uh, but also in many other places in Scripture. And those things are faith, love, and hope. Now you might be saying, Shane, you got them out of order. It's faith, hope, love, isn't it? Isn't that the correct order it's supposed to be in? Well, in other places in the Bible, these three attributes show up again. Paul used them in the book of Romans, for example, or talks about it in 1 Thessalonians, or the most famous one, which is 1 Corinthians, where he talks about faith, hope, and the most important of these is love. Who, who did that at their wedding? Was that your scripture reading at your wedding, anybody? I'm going to call you out right here. That's too bad, because I was about to be like, that's a great scripture reading. But this one's a little bit out of order, but he talks about these three characteristics and that we should, too, among ourselves, be looking for this characteristic. The first one is love. He says, what is he thankful for? He says, since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, he writes here, faith in Christ Jesus, he puts the title first. What kind of faith is he talking about here? What does faith mean? Well, it's not faith, the set of beliefs. It's faith as in trust or belief. To trust in Christ, to have faith 
in Christ, to believe in Christ. You know what it's like? Well, my kids did a little uh, swimming this, uh, this, this week, the, the, last, the last week of, uh, last swimming probably of the summer. And as they're heading out the door, I reminded of how much they've grown. I remember when they were little and we'd go swimming. I don't know if you ever did this. They'd be standing outside the pool in their, whatever the floaties were in vogue at the time. And you'd be like, come on, jump in, I'll catch you. And they're like, no, I'm not going to do it. And you're like, yeah, come on, and I'll catch you. And then they do, and they love it. And so for the next six hours, all you were doing is catching them as they jump into water over and over and over again. Now, would they jump in the water if you weren't there? Not yet. Well, maybe you have one of those really good swimmers. But for most of, most of them, not yet, right? They are jumping in because they trust you. They believe you're going to catch you, and that causes them to jump. That's what we're talking about here. That's what we mean by faith. That kind of faith where in all of our lives, we're kind of jumping into the arms of Jesus, which is guys are like, that's not super appealing, Shane. But you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's this, this idea that he is there for us, that he's going to catch us, that he's going to lead us along, that our eternity is in his hands. Faith is the first one. The second one in this chapter is love. He says he's thankful for their, uh, for their faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. You know, when I hear love, I want to know, well, what does that mean? What kind of love are we talking about here? Because sometimes we talk about love in our American culture and people talk, we just need more love. And I'm like, yeah, yes, agreed. But I don't really know what you mean by that. And sometimes love is talked about as this like vibe. Like, I just want the vibe of love. I just want, I just want, to, I just want it the warm fuzzies of love. But that's not really what the scriptures are talking about. You might feel some warm fuzzies of love in a Christian life. I hope you do to some extent. But love is much deeper than that when it's talking about the love that Christ has shown us. Or the love, in this example, that the saints are to have for one another. What did Jesus say about love? Well, in Luke chapter 6 talked about the fact that we should love our enemies. That's a different kind of love, isn't it? Or in John, that love has no greater than this to give up one's life for one's friends. That's a little different. It's a sacrificial love. It's the kind of love where we are quick to forgive when we wouldn't normally forgive. It's the kind of love where we're ready to let things go faster. There's a, it's the kind of love that when we are unified, even though we might actually disagree on some things, but we remain in unity as we work through those. It's the kind of love where we're willing to sacrifice our time or our resources or our money to help someone else when they are in need. It's the love for all the saints, the love that Christ has shown us that we could also show one another. So we have faith. We have love, and then we have hope. And actually, as we read into the hope section here, we realize why he's put it in this order. And he gives us kind of a reason. The word because is there. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Meaning, I am so thankful for your faith in Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints because of this great hope you have, which is laid up for you in heaven. This hope of the future. And again, I want to define that word hope for us. It's different than the way the common American usage of hope. When we kind of in common American English use the word hope, it's something that we desire to happen, but may or may not happen. For example, uh, for example uh, last Sunday, I hoped that the New England Patriots would beat the Eagles. That did not happen, right? Right? But that's what we mean by the word hope. Man, I really desire this thing to happen. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. That's not the kind of word, uh, that's not, it literally does not have the same meaning in the Bible. When you see the word hope in the Bible, it means something that you know is going to happen, that you already have assurance will come true, and it is that desire for it to come true, that longing for it to come true, that having your life's dependence on a coming True. My hope is in Christ, that, he, that one day I will live in eternity with him and that my life is going to be changed today. That's what we mean by hope. And you know, any of these three things, I mean, I could go on and on. Each of these could be their own sermon. I mean, these are deep, deep <laughs> subjects that are throughout the Bible. But Paul here is, is not lingering on them long because he's talking about them as a whole. 
that these are pieces that are fitting together because he's thanking all the attributes he's seeing that, that, that shows that, yeah, this church is healthy and he's going to encourage them to remain healthy. And so for us, we don't want to look at just one of these things, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense for us to be like, listen, my faith is great, but I really don't like any of my brothers and sisters in Christ. Like that would not be great. That would not be a good indication of your growing faith in, in Jesus Christ. Or like, it's the same thing with physical health. You say, Shane, are you healthy? And if I only looked at this elbow and I was like, yes, I'm totally healthy based on this elbow, everything's going great. When many of you know, I actually injured my other elbow and I'm rehabbing it right now, right? We wouldn't just point to one thing. So, so he's giving them several things here and he's not lingering on it because like these are the attributes together. These things all work together. This faith, this love, and this hope. That's what it looks like to be a people who are healthy in Jesus Christ. And so we want to think in our lives, are we growing in these areas? Is my faith and trust in him growing? Is that leading me to love my brother and sister in Christ more? Am, am, am I growing in that area? Am I growing in my hope? Do I know I will live for eternity? And how will that change the way I live my life today? Faith, love, hope. You may be saying, Shane, well, how do I grow in these things? Because I want to grow. I want to, I, I want to know God more. I want to understand. I want to have this, this solid faith. I want to have a, a deeper love and, and understand what that means for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to have a hope that kind of carries me through on the difficult days of life. How do I do that? Well, I'm glad you asked because that's what Paul is going to talk about next. His prayer then turns from thanksgiving for what God has already done in the Colossians to his prayer for them, what he hopes God does for them next. And in that, we will also see for us what it looks like to grow. Okay? Let's keep reading. Verse 9. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to the glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Well, there's a lot there, so let's start from the beginning, because once again, he kind of talks about three ways, three Three things that will grow and develop uh, their faith that is the result of their growing faith in Jesus Christ, what it will produce. And so the first thing he says is knowledge. He says here, a knowledge of God's will, a knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And it's interesting that he qualifies the first time he says the word knowledge. Uh, there's, there's obviously something very broad here. That's why he uses several different words to kind of talk about it. But the first one is knowledge of his will. It's not just knowledge about God. It's not just knowledge about the Bible. It's knowledge of God's will, what he is doing in the world and what he has called us to. What is his will for you? You may be saying, well, Shane, are you asking a specific question or a general question? Well, sometimes we have those very specific questions. What's God's will for me right here? But sometimes God's will is just about how you're to live your life. For example, later in the book of Colossians, he is going, uh, uh, Paul is going to express for me what God's will is for me as a husband. And I'm going to be called to be a husband who sacrificially loves my wife. Right? That's God's will for me there. There's, what's God's will for you as a parent? What's God's will for you as a believer? What's God's will for you at work? What's God's will for you and how you could be a testimony to the outside world? That's the kind of thing he is talking about. What is God doing in you and around you? That knowledge will help you grow and develop in your faith, as well as all the other knowledge of who he is and what he's doing in this world. So the first one is knowledge. The second one is holiness. Now, some of you have been like, Shane, I've read this Bible passage, and the word holiness is nowhere to be seen in the passage. Well, hold on. I'll, I'll defend it. Let me talk about the different elements that are in this one, because they are definitely set apart from the first one, and definitely set apart from the last one. There's this little group in the middle. 
So he talks about spiritual wisdom and understanding. Verse 10, so, we'll get back to that so. Everyone remember the so? Is everyone remembering the so? 75%, that's pretty good. And so, uh, as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Or I think you could sum up all those things together and say, Holiness. Because sometimes when we think of holiness, we think of purity. Now, purity is a very important part of holiness. But the concept of being holy or holiness is much larger than just that category of purity. Then we use that word holiness, the word holy itself, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, means to be set apart. God is said to be holy because he is set apart from the rest of the world. He is its creator, and there is no one like him. He is set apart from his world. And so he calls the, his people, who are to be like him, to be set apart from the world as well. To be different than the rest of the world that they are living in. To be holy. And that's why I think this list could be summed up very well in holiness. For them to be, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. That they are living a life that looks like Jesus. That they are to be bearing fruit. That means producing something in every good work. And increasing in the knowledge of God. Kind of interesting that knowledge of God comes back. We got a little cycle here. You increase in the knowledge of God because you understand his will. And then that helps you produce a, no, a more knowledge of God. And we got a little cycle going on here. But that's the second one, holiness. That as we understand God more, as we come to a deeper understanding of who he is and his will for us, it will naturally change our lives. We will be different and be set apart from the rest of the world because we are in Christ. So we have knowledge, we have holiness. And the third one he mentions here, we're real good at doing lists in this passage, is in verse 11. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of an inheritance of the saints of light. So the third one is spiritual strength. What kind of spiritual strength? Well, he tells us strength for endurance and patience with joy. Woo, that's a big one. I mean, endurance, okay. Okay, patience. Yes, I know I need patience. I need patience. I need patience. Uh, with joy, that's hard work. No wonder we need spiritual power to experience that kind of life change. And I actually talked to a lot of people this week who were experiencing that this week. We're having to, needing endurance to get through their medical issues. Who are having to practice patience because they're waiting for a diagnosis and do not have it and it's stumping the doctors and I could only imagine how frustrating that is. But the spiritual power that God can work in us, we can endure, and we can be patient, and sometimes even with joy. And also, he says, giving thanks to the Father, that that should be our reaction to what God is doing in us. This thankfulness for what he has done. And that is one of the biggest difference I see with believers in, 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 for example, in that hospital situation. And the guys I talked to this week, just how thankful they are, even when things are not going super well, but thankful that God is walking them through this season where they are having to be patient and, and, and endure a trial. So that's the third spiritual power. And there's a sequence to this. Remember I said to remember the so? Well, that implies a sequence that you would be filled with all spiritual knowledge so that you would put on this holiness and the holiness would be generated for you. And then after that holiness, after your life has been changed, then you'll have the spiritual power to confront whatever life might bring you. And this is the pattern of growing in Christ. To grow in our knowledge of him and his will, which leads to our life change of holiness, which gives us the power to live this life for him today. And that's, that's what Paul's prayer for the Colossians is. And that should be our prayer as well. 
But there's one more thing I want to talk about this morning. Because there's a really essential uh, piece of this and how we actually go about being a people of love or a faith, uh, love, and hope, and how we be a people who could grow in our knowledge and holiness and spiritual understanding. That is implied in the passage, uh, but that we kind of need to bring out here this morning. Because in most other cultures, this wouldn't occur, but in kind of our American Christian mindset, we sometimes have this idea every time we, uh, you know, hear a message or read something in the scriptures, okay, what am I going to do this week for this? Like for me, uh, by myself, I'm going to get a new book or I'm going to start a new, I'm going to listen to some sermons online or something like that. And it's really for me. And listen, that, that is good. That's a good thing to like look, you know, to look at the scriptures and be like, yeah, I want to grow in these areas and to say that. But that's not really what this passage is talking about. There's no singular anywhere here in this passage. In all the places in this passage, it is the church at Colossae, all of them together who are going on this journey. He's not interested in specific individuals in this. It is the church as a whole. That the church as a whole should be growing in their, their, their faith, their love, their hope. That the, that the pathway to spiritual development for this whole body of believers is knowledge and holiness and, and spiritual power that they will walk through. And that is what will generate a life that follows Jesus for them. And so what he's really calling them to, and, and what he is praying that God will do, will continue to work through these people together to grow in their faith. And the same calling is on us today. I think it's very interesting. Paul never met these people, and yet he's writing them this letter. Because he did life together with Epaphras and trained him up in the Lord. And Epaphras then went out and among these people, this, this, this gospel power that he talks about here, that is bearing fruit and increasing, is going out and changing their lives. And so my encouragement to you, as you think about your faith, your love, your hope, is to think beyond just yourself and to ask, how can we do this together? How can we pursue Christ together? How are we doing together in the faith, the love, and hope that Christ is growing here at Pine Grove? And I think much like the Colossians, while Pine Grove is not perfect, are we perfect? No, absolutely not. But is Christ growing something here at Pine Grove amongst us? I think so. I see a lot of evidence as a people's strong faith in Jesus Christ. I see people treating each other with the love of Jesus Christ. I see people uh, uh, with, with a great hope for the future, even if there is difficult for today. I see these things all the time. The question is, how do we go about doing this together on this pathway together? And so I want to encourage you first, if you're not in any kind of biblical community, is kind of the word we've used before, or Christ-centered community, if there's no group that you are together with who really knows what's going on in your life, I mean really know, not walking to, hey, how are you doing today? I'm fine because that's what you're supposed to say. You have to. It's a brief interaction. But someone who, when they ask you that question, you give them the real answer. Do you have a place where that is happening? Do you have a place where you're opening up the word of God together and you're growing in the knowledge of his will together? Is there a place where you are praying for one another, just like Paul is praying for these the Colossian people, together? And if it's not, I would really encourage you, because we've got all sorts of stuff going on here. We, we, we over the last couple of years, have been— well, I'll get to that in a second. Point is, you can still join a community group. Come talk to Pastor Jaden, who's leading worship on piano today. New groups are still getting started right now. Now's a great time to jump in in the fall. There's ladies' Bible studies, men's breakfast. They just had their first one on Saturday. There are places where you can go to kind of grow spiritually, but it's, it's, it's only so much is going to happen on your own. It happens in the context of being together. I experienced this firsthand when I first came to, to faith in Jesus Christ. I, I came to faith, and I had a pretty uh, dramatic uh, post-college um, uh, conversion. I felt like so many parts of my life had changed. My thoughts and attitudes about certain things overnight changed from one thing to another. And then for a while, it was just kind of, kind of steady. Kind of just like, okay, now what? And I feel like I was asking now what for a very long time. It probably wasn't actually that, that long, but, but I was asking now what until uh, after getting married, uh, Cheryl and I moved up 
to Massachusetts and joined a, a church plant there. I was kind of in limbo of where I was living and everything in some in-between times there. And once we dug into that, that church plant and, and began participating in that small group, well, suddenly my faith began to grow because these guys were asking me real questions. <laughs> like, well, how is this playing out in your life, Shane? I'm like, oh, my life? Uh-oh. You know? Oh, that is a good suggestion. Oh, maybe I should be growing in, in, in this way. And that, I had to learn that like, oh, okay, as much as I loved reading the scriptures, which I did, as much as I loved learning about God, which I did, as much as I wanted to grow, and I did, I simply could only do so much on my own. I required the body of Christ with me, working these things out so that my faith would actually grow and my love would actually grow and my hope would actually grow. That's the first thing I want to encourage you. If you're not plugged in somewhere, now is the time. And two, if you are plugged in somewhere, let me encourage you as well to be intentional with that time. To remember this. To ask yourself that question. Okay, well, I do these things. In what ways am I helping build up the faith, love, and hope here at Pine Grove with my brothers and sisters in Christ? Because over the past couple of years, we've spent a lot of uh, time kind of rebuilding some structures of the church, uh, you know, setting up community groups and different ministries and getting leaders in place and those kinds of things. And that's important. I'm glad we spent some time to do that. But now we cannot forget the purpose of all these things, that every one of our ministries that meets is meet with the purpose of loving God, loving others, and making authentic followers of Jesus Christ. That every ministry that we have here, is, we are hoping that it produces out of it this faith and love and hope among us and everyone we come into contact to. And so as you participate in these things, boy, you know what? I hope you enjoy them. And I hope you enjoy the relationships that are formed through these ministries. But be intentional. And ask yourself this week, am I being intentional with my time with these people? Am I seeing a place to encourage someone else's faith, their love, their hope? Are we growing in our knowledge of the Savior? Increasing in our holiness and tapping into the spiritual power that Christ would have for us? So that's the answer to ask yourself this week. How can we grow and do these things together? Because it said here in the text, we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to this kingdom of light. It's like we've been transported. So why would we live like we are still in the kingdom of darkness when we are in the kingdom of light? And all of that thanks to what, because of what Christ has done for us. And so we're going to take a moment this morning to thank Christ for what he has done for us to do that in a tangible, visible way. And when we celebrate communion, we are really doing two things. One, we are celebrating our connection with God because of what Christ has done for us. Let's think about his body and his blood. How his blood was shed on the cross for our sins and that he was resurrected from the dead so that all who believe would have eternal life and a changed life today. But also, we have communion with each other. Because we have been transferred as an eternal family into this kingdom of light, since we are called in that passage the saints of life. And so during this time, I hope you will pray during our time of communion that God would show you how to encourage one another that, to, or, or to spend that time uh, right now kind of thanking God for what he has done for you in that as we come to the table and celebrate it together. I want to invite our elders who are serving to come forward.